Um, we're going to be reading from the book of Exodus. Uh, it's split into two, two readings. We're going to start at Exodus 33, verse 7. I'm going to go all the way through until 34, verse 7, and then we'll skip a bit. But Exodus 33, starting at verse 7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. And whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people rose and stood at the entrances to their tents, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance of their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young assistant Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Moses said to the people, said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favour with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favour with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face or no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you, where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back but my face must not be seen. The Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which he broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up to Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Not even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out the two stone tablets like the first ones and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his, proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Uh, we're going to just skip down to verse 29 and then finish off the chapter. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant of of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. After all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. 
And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. This is God's word. Thanks for having me. It's really uh, great to be here. We are working through Exodus in our church. That's where you've got Exodus 33 this morning. It's, a, it's an amazing chapter. Um, I don't know whether you have ever received an invitation to a birthday party. And on that invitation, it's got, it's got something like this. Uh, no gifts, please. Your presence is the best gift ever. Ever see that kind of thing? No gifts, please. I just want your presence. And to be honest, I used to think that those kind of invitations were a bit corny, a bit cringy, a bit cheesy. But actually, they're really beautiful. They're really beautiful because that person is saying to you, they don't care what you bring. They just want you. They're not bothered about what gifts you bring them. They just want your company. They want your presence with them. It's like as a, as a father, those moments where you've got your whole family in, in one room and you don't care what they bring to that family gathering. You just want them in the same place to be in their presence. And my question really this morning is, is that how you feel about God? It's less about the gifts that he gives you and more about his presence with you. It's less about all the the benefits of being a Christian, all the blessings of being a Christian, and more about just having God present in your life. Less about what he can do for you, just having him with you. That's what you desire most in life. All you want is God. Tozer said this, nothing in or of this world measures up to the simple pleasure of experiencing the presence of God. And what he's saying is that you could have everything this world offers you. You could have the best family, the best car, the best house, the best friends. And all those things are wonderful gifts of God. But they don't compare with the pleasure and the joy of being in the presence of God. And I don't know whether you've experienced that. John Edwards talks about being on his knees for one hour and experienced the, the, the presence and the glory of God like never before. He ever experienced that? Mo McShane says that a believer longs after God to come into God's presence, to feel God's love, to feel God near him in the, in the secret place, to feel in a crowd that God is nearer than every other creature. Oh, dear brethren, have you ever tasted this blessedness? There is greater rest and solace to be found in the presence of God for one hour than in an eternity in the presence of people. Let me tell you about my friend Russell. I knew Russell 30 years ago in the UK and Russell had everything. He was ridiculously good looking. He was sporty, had an incredible job in the city of London earning mega bucks. He owned a house in Surrey. He had a good marriage, two beautiful kids. And he knew about God. He went to church semi-regularly, and then Russell lost everything. His health went, he was fired from his job, lost the house, marriage started to crumble. Praise God, it's now been reconciled. But in that season of life, he encountered God and experienced God, and he experienced this closeness with God like never before, and he experienced the peace of God and the presence of God. It totally transformed him. And Russell describes his life as a life of two halves. Everything the world offers with a bit of God or having nothing except God. And he said he would choose having nothing in this world but having God in his life every single day second. That's our theme this morning, the the presence of God, not just a bit of God, but having all of God, God having all of you, God leading you, God guiding you, God before you, God behind you, God over you, experiencing God, encountering God, being captivated by God. So in Exodus, and if you know the book of Exodus, 
God's presence is really the big theme of Exodus. God revealing his presence. The God who is there in captivity, in slavery in Egypt, God saw them and God heard their cries and God acted. God said, I'll be your God and you'll be my people. And, and God's presence has led them all the way. He's been with them in the plagues. He's been with them as he divides the Red Sea. He's been with them in the wilderness as he provides food, the manna and the quail and water from the rock. He's been with them as they fight the Amalekites. He's been present. And God has been present with them at Mount Sinai. He's come down with thunder and lightning. He's spoken to Moses. God has showed up. He's been with them. But now God's people have stuffed up. And if you know Exodus, Exodus 32 is a pivotal chapter. Remember Moses up the mountain, meeting with God, hearing the commandments, hearing the instructions for the tabernacle. The people are down the mountain and they're building a golden calf. The people who've just encountered God are now idolizing and worshiping a golden calf. They're taking the, the good gifts that God gives them, the, the gold that God has given them, they're supposed to be used for the tabernacle, they're now used to build a golden calf called idolatry. It's called finding your identity and your worth and your value and significance in the things of this world rather than God himself. And God is so angry with them that he wants to wipe them out. If you know Exodus 32, Moses intercedes and pleads and God relents. And then God forgives them. That's extraordinary. Forgiveness is extraordinary. But please know this, that forgiveness doesn't mean no consequences. Just because you're forgiven by God doesn't mean that there aren't consequences for your behavior. I hope you know that. At the end of chapter 32, Moses tells, God tells Moses to lead the people. In 32 verse 34, he says, my angel will go before you. Not God himself, but my angel. Down to 33 verse 3, he says to Moses, go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, to the promised land. But, verse 3, this is a horrible verse, but I will not go with you. Because you're stiff-necked, you're stubborn, you're rebellious, you're impossible to lead. And I might destroy you on the way. That is the consequence. Yes, they're forgiven, but the consequence is God removing his presence. And verse 3 is a bit of a conundrum. He says, I'll give you the land, but you can't have me. I'll give you all the blessings of the promised land. You have the wealth and the security, the prosperity. You can have all that stuff but I won't be with you. How would you feel about that? Having all the gifts of God, the blessings of God, but not God himself. Uh, Rachel and I, my wife that is, honeymooned in Hawaii. It was amazing. But imagine the, the, if the day before we went on our honeymoon, Rachel turned around to me and said, actually, I can't come with you. And if I turned around to my wife and said, oh, that's okay. <laughs> I'll still enjoy Hawaii. I mean, there's, there's karaoke, there's beach, and I'll have a great time. And it's sad you can't come, but I'll still have fun. What would she have said to that? What I should have said is, is very, she didn't say that, but what, 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 what you must say is, is is right, if you, if you don't go, I don't want to go either. Because a honeymoon is not a honeymoon unless you're there. Hawaii is not Hawaii unless you're there with me. And John Piper asked this very confronting question. He says, if you could have heaven with all your family and friends, if you could be reunited with loved ones, have all the food you love, see beautiful sunsets, golf, beaches, mountains, fishing, whatever you're into, if you could have all that stuff in heaven, but if Jesus is not there, would you still want to go? That's our question this morning. Do you want God himself or just the gift that God gives you? The savoring God's presence, that's our first point, savoring God's presence. Because when God told his people that he wouldn't go with them, look at their response, verse four, uh, where the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn, they grieved, they were distressed at the thought of God not going with them. 
And no one put on, on any, any ornaments. That is not Christmas decorations. That's the, the rings, the bracelets, all the things that identify them with the world. They, they're kind of sitting in sackcloth and ashes. They are broken by their sin and what they've done because they just want God. That's basically, God, you can keep all your promised land stuff. If you don't go, we don't want to go either. And verses 7 onwards are really sad verses because if you know Exodus, God has spent six long chapters instructing his people how to build this incredible tabernacle. And God longs to dwell with his people. He's established a tabernacle so God can dwell amongst his people in all his glory. Now read verse 7. Now Moses used to take a tent. Not a tabernacle, but a tent and pitch it outside of the camp. That is significant, some distance away, outside of the camp. So outside of the camp is where people were sent when they were forsaken. Outside of the camp is where you went to dig your hole to put your excrement in. Outside of the camp is where they placed Christ outside the city walls. And it's just a visual thing that the God who used to be there amongst their midst, among them, with them, over them, is now there. And Moses can go and meet with God, but he's the only one. God will be present with Moses, but outside of the camp. And so Moses goes to the tent in verse 9, and whenever he goes there, verse 9 tells us that the the pillar of cloud would come down. That's the, the symbol that God is there. God is with him. And verse 11 is a beautiful verse of what it really means to have the presence of God in your life. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. That that, that picture of intimacy, no awkwardness. He just tells God like a friend exactly how he feels, what he wants, what he's sorry for. This deep intimacy and connectivity with God. That's what it means for God to be with you. And so the angels with the people, God is going to go with Moses But Moses says, that's not good enough, God. He intercedes again. He pleads again in verse 12. He says to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people. But God, you haven't let me know whom you will send with me. Who who is this angel bloke that you're going to send with me? You've said, I I know you by name and you found favor with me. And that's wonderful, God. I love the fact that you've chosen me and called me and loved me and I've found favor. Thank you, God, for that. But actually... I want more than that. If you're pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you personally. I don't just want the stuff you can give me. I want to know you, God. And the Lord replies in verse 14, my presence or literally my face will go with you. The you there in verse 14 is singular you. So I will go with you, Moses. That's the promise he makes to Moses, that God will be present in Moses' life. And I don't know whether you've ever sung that song. I think it's it's called Never Walk Alone. And it says, you're always present. You're always with me. For all of my life, your favor has followed. You're my covering. I've never walked alone. Never been abandoned. You're my inheritance. You're my strength and my shield. In every hour, every minute, you've always been there. You are faithful. In every triumph, every failure, you are loyal to me. You are faithful. I've never walked alone. That's what the presence of God means. He is your strength. He's your shield. He's your confidence. He's your provision. He's your protector. It's just having him in your life. He's always there. Like the closest friend who never, ever, ever, ever lets you down. Look at verse 14 again. That my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. That's the the result of God's presence, rest for your soul. That that peace, that calm in the chaos, that that settledness that you know who you are. You stop striving, you stop, um, you cease your, your efforts to prove yourself. You just know who you are in God and you're satisfied with him. That's what the presence of God is. It's a being held onto, being comforted, being protected, having this calmness. When all around you, there's chaos. And so God will be with Moses, and that's wonderful. That's incredible. But what about the rest of these rebellious people? 
And, and Moses is very audacious. He says in verse 15, sorry, God, but if your presence doesn't go with us, see that change? Verse 14, my presence will go with you, Moses. And he says, no, no, no. What about us? What about us rebellious people? What about the people that you have delivered and you've redeemed? What about your redeemed people? If your presence doesn't go with us, do not send us up from here. He's basically saying, we don't want to go to the promised land, God, if you're not with us. And I love verse 16. You could preach a whole sermon on verse 16. How will anyone know that you, God, are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from the other people on the face of the earth? It's an incredible statement. He's basically saying, if you just send an angel, we're nothing but nice, moral, decent, religious people. God, it is your presence with us that distinguishes us from every other person around us. Because what makes Israel so special is not that they've got the land or the tabernacle or they, not they've got the law, not that they've got them some strength or some righteousness or some obedience. It's not their wealth, their looks, their success. What makes Israel so special and distinct is the presence of the almighty God with them. You ever thought about that? What distinguishes you as a, a Christian from your neighbors and your family who don't know Christ? It's not that you go to church. It's not that you have these rules and rituals that they find really weird. It's not even that you're a nice person. It's the presence of God in your life that distinguishes you from them. That they see in you somebody who has a peace about you, a, a purpose in life that you are secure in Christ, an identity in Christ. That's what distinguishes you from the unbelieving world. And when someone walks into any church, they shouldn't just say, oh, that's amazing music or that's an amazing welcome. They should say, like 1 Corinthians says, surely God is here in this midst. So do you personally savor the presence of God in your life? One of my favorite New Testament verses is Matthew chapter 11, when Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. And he's picking up on Exodus 33, verse 14. He's saying, come to me and I'll give you rest. You find rest now in the presence of Jesus. So if you're burdened and you're weary and you're exhausted by your sin and your suffering, come to Jesus, not, not a church, not, not a religion, but to a person called Jesus and you'll find rest in him. So to be honest, I, I don't want to struggle onto heaven by myself without Jesus. I actually don't want to go to heaven if Jesus is not there. And the longer I've been a Christian, the less I desire all the stuff that God gives me, which is, which is beautiful and wonderful. And the more I just want him. And if you're a believer here today, which I hope you are if you're at Bible college, then, but don't assume that because there are people who don't really believe at Bible college. If you're a believer here today, the extraordinary news is this, that we don't need to plead with God for his presence. We don't need to question whether God is with us. Because when Jesus came, he said he's going to leave this earth and send his Holy Spirit, who is the counselor, the comforter, and he promised that the Spirit of God would indwell every believer. And so if you're here today as a believer in Christ, you have got God with you. He's present with you by his Holy Spirit, indwelling you. And so it's slightly different from the Israelites because we're not asking, is God with us? He is with us. He's present 24-7. The question is, are you saving his presence? Are you enjoying his presence? Uh, my eldest son, Sam, did his HSC last year. And I've got vivid memories about this time last year, actually, sitting around the, the dining room table and where he used to study. Uh, and he'd be there with his laptop on and he'd be studying for his maths HSC. And he'd make these odd noises like, oh, gosh, I don't understand this. And I would be there and I would say, oh, can I help you? Oh, no, I'm fine, Dad, I'm fine, Dad. Oh, I don't understand this. And I'm like, Sam, can I just give you five minutes to help you? No, Dad, don't need your help. I'll be fine, totally fine. And inside, I am thinking, Sam, I've got a PhD in mathematics. <laughs> and, and I'm here in your presence offering you help. <laughs> And you think you're fine. <laughs> and we laugh. 
and yet we do that with God all the time. God is with you saying, here I am, I'm here to help you, I want to help you. I can comfort you, I can care for you, I can carry you. I can show you the right way. But we're so good at saying, oh no, I'm fine. I've got this, God. Let me do it my way. And so we only really depend on God's presence when we are in desperate need. Rather than him being our first call. Help. Please, God. Thank you, God, for your help, your comfort, your strength. Why do we do that? Why aren't we savoring his presence by his Holy Spirit 24-7? One thing God has done in my life in the last two years, two years ago, I was in a very dark, dark, dark space. And I've actually stopped focusing on what I do for God and begun to enjoy sitting with God, if that makes any sense. Just my time in prayer, my time of just seeking his face and his favor, my time of running to him 24-7, and this, when he points out a sin in my life, that's, that's now a comfort, and when I don't know what to pray for, the Spirit is groaning for me, and I can approach him at all times, 24-7. It's just been delightful and wonderful. Because I've experienced God's presence like I never had before. And I do pray for my church members, name by name, most weeks. I just pray a simple prayer, Lord, be with them. And that's not a lame prayer. Because I'm really asking that they would encounter and experience the presence of God in a deep, intimate way. So saving God's presence and then more quickly radiating God's glory. Mo Moses is bold. He's audacious. He's not, he's not satisfied with God's presence. He, he wants to see God's glory. He wants a deeper revelation of God. Verse 18 is an audacious request. Moses says, show me your glory. Show me your weightiness, your worth, your heaviness, your otherness. Show me how awesome and majestic you really are, God. And I think he's a bit like Peter at the transfiguration. I'm not sure he really understands what he's asking. And if you stop at this moment, you think that's just fascinating because, because Moses has already seen plenty of God's glory. Moses has seen more of God's glory than any other human being up to this point in history. He's seen God's miraculous provision. He's seen God's mighty hand dividing that Red Sea. He's seen God provide the manna and the quail. He's seen God defeat the armies. He's seen God's glory. But he wants more. He wants more of God. A greater revelation of God, if you were. Because again, I hope you know the more you know God, the more of God you want to know. Show me your glory, says Moses. And God says, verse 19, no. Sorry, Moses, that's not possible. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. So part of my glory, a fraction of my glory. And part of his glory, verse 19, is actually his sovereign grace. Part of his glory is that, is that God has the right to choose who he chooses. I know you don't like that, but that is part of his glory. His sovereign electing grace. But, verse 20, you cannot see my face. You can't see my full-on glory for no one can see me and live. We just sung about the sun. You can feel the rays of the sun. You can bask in the warmth of the sun, but you can't stare at the sun. It's too glorious. And so verse 21 onwards, the Lord hides him in a rock and his glory passes by, but he protects Moses and covers Moses with his hand. And then he removes his hand, verse 21, 23 rather, and, and Moses sees the back of God not literally his back, the afterglow of his glory. And verses chapter 34 is a chapter of God's grace because God renews the covenant. God replaces these two stone tablets that were smashed. And when you think two tablets, don't think commandment one to four on one and commandment five to 10 on the other, that's nonsense. The 10 commandments are on both tablets because one tablet is for God, it will go in the Ark of the Covenant, and once one, one tablet is for the people, it's like two wedding rings, a sign of the covenant. And so God speaks. 
And God does reveal his glory or part of his glory or a glimpse of his glory. And God reveals his character because that's how you see God's glory. Verse 6, he says, the Lord, the Lord. And please don't hear that repetition as being you know, just, just um, affirmative. It's kind of like a, an intimacy. Remember, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Or Martha, Martha, why are you so busy? The Lord, the Lord, like a father tenderly revealing who he is. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate God, because that's, that's God's glory, that he's compassionate. He is not cruel. He's not harsh. He's tender, gentle. When he sees people wandering, he has his gut-wrenching longing to help. That's his glory. He's gracious. Doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. That's his glory. He is so patient with us. He is slow to anger. He doesn't fly off the handle. He waits and waits and waits and waits like the, the father waiting for his son to go home. He's abounding in love. That is his hesed love, his protective, constant, sacrificial, never changing love. He's so faithful, doesn't change, keeps his word does what he says he will do. He's so forgiving, he forgives wickedness and rebellion. He's so just, he, it's right that he punishes wrong. That, that is God's glory. He's compassionate, gracious, patient, loving, faithful, just. That is the glory of God that we, we get the privilege of, of knowing and seeing. And here where, here's where it completely blows your mind. Because Moses says to God, show me your glory. And God says to Moses, no, you can't see my glory. You see my goodness. And then Jesus steps into the world. And what does Jesus say in John chapter 1? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his, his glory. So in the person of Jesus Christ, God is revealing more of his glory. And so as Jesus walks on earth, you actually get to see God's glory face to face. If you'd been there, you'd have seen his compassion the way he had his gut-wrenching response to the crowd who were harassed and helped like a sheep without a shepherd. You'd have seen his grace. You'd have seen his love to these people who were rebels. You'd have seen his faithfulness. You'd have seen the way that he forgave people. So we get to see God's glory in a way that Moses didn't get to see because we see Jesus. It's not rocket science. If you want to encounter God's glory, you encounter Jesus. You want to see more of God's glory, spend more and more time gazing at Jesus, who Jesus is, how he treated people, how he behaved. And I do believe in our church that is our biggest need to see the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And you can spot somebody who has seen the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You spot it by their worship. That's 34 verse 8. You spot it by their obedience. That's the rest of chapter 34. It's full on, not compromising, not flirting with the world, not intermarrying, loving to obey. But here's the big way you see if someone has seen the glory of God. If you have seen the glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ, it will just radiate from you. People will see God clearly in you and through you. And I'm not talking about whether you can write an essay on God's glory. I'm not talking about whether you can preach a sermon on God's glory. I'm asking whether the, the glory of God just radiates from you. Because I can spot the people who have spent time in the presence of Jesus. And I know that you can too. We we'll finish with verses 29 to 35. Moses comes down the mountain and he, verse 29, he's not aware his face was radiant. His face is glowing. He'd been with God, he'd spoken with God, he'd been intimate with God, and his face is glowing, shining. Aaron and the other Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near because when you radiate God's glory, other people don't necessarily like that. And when Moses finished speaking, he put a veil over his face like a bridal veil because it's too brilliant, too glorious for the people to see. So let me ask you, what do you radiate when you walk into a room? 
Do you radiate wealth? Do people see, you know, the bling and the clothes and the cars and the houses? Do you radiate, I don't know, do you radiate fitness, <laughs> your physique or your tone body, or, or do you radiate Jesus? Does Jesus just shine out of you? And I love spending time with people who show me more and more of Jesus. I love spending time with people who just radiate Christ to me. And I can tell they've sat in the presence of Jesus and they've seen the glory of God in the person of Jesus. I can tell they've spent time up the mountain, as it were, with God. Because they radiate something beautiful. And to be honest, I am more than a bit bored with spending time with people who radiate sport and Netflix and everything that I call low and not sure. And I want to spend more time with people who radiate Jesus. And here's what I find interesting, that the more I radiate Jesus, the more, the more time I spend with Jesus, the more I, I froth over his compassion, his grace, his kindness, his love, the more I just want to talk about Jesus. I have found that people don't like that. They say, oh, Paul, you're so full on for Jesus. And they're like, well, actually, when Moses radiates the glory of God, the people were uncomfortable. The people didn't say, hey, Moses, your face is shining with God's glory. That's cool. That's so cool. Let's hang out together. <laughs> they didn't like it. Because it's uncomfortable when you're face to face with the brilliance and the glory of God, isn't it? If you are radiating Christ, some of your friends will be confronted by that. Even your Christian friends will be confronted by that. You'll be confronting them with their lack of glory. So now when people say, Paul, you're so, so full on for Jesus, I say thank you very much. And if you're here today thinking, oh, I don't think I radiate God's, God's glory, how, how'd you do that, Paul? Well, it's, it's really not rocket science. You spend more and more time in the presence of Jesus. Forgive me, Dave, but maybe study less and sit more with Jesus. If you're in a church, maybe serve Jesus less and sit with Jesus more. Ensure that every day that you have time in his presence, just devouring Jesus. Meditate on his, on his compassion, his grace, his love, his justice, and just see the way that he is so beautiful. Because that's what this world needs, people who just wander around shining Jesus into a world that doesn't know him. And the extraordinary thing is that we get to radiate Jesus with unveiled faces. According to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we with unveiled faces are being transformed more and more to the lives of Christ. Let me pray. Uh, Father, as we head into this end of semester and exam period or assessment writing, would you show us more and more of who Jesus is? May we enjoy more time in his presence experiencing his love, his compassion, his grace, his mercy. And may we be people who don't just teach Jesus, but radiate him from our very beings. And we ask that for Jesus' sake. Amen.